ideas about what might be useful to advance education in, in Rhode Island. I just started talking and getting feedback, and the ideas really have changed over that period of months, got lots of great feedback. One of the things that I heard uh, long before I came to Rhode Island was that the idea that uh, reform, that schools can be improved from a, a, a top-down perspective is not only something that people have deep, just philosophical concerns about, but also there just isn't a whole lot of evidence that it actually uh, changes the things that we want to do to really improve teaching and learning. And for me, it always comes back to teaching and learning. There really is no ideology other than what are we doing to improve the way we teach and improve the way students are learning. And one of the things that I've just kind of been thinking about for a long time is what creates uh, the culture in a school of not only excellence, but people who just want to do everything in their power to keep getting better. And that, to me, seems not only true about the way schools can operate, but it's true in every organization. It's true in the private sector. It's true in the nonprofit se sector and so on. If you really look at organizations that are at the top of their game, just doing whatever it is that they do really, really well, it often turns into a, a culture that either exists or doesn't exist that we're we're great at what we do, but no matter how good we are, we just can always get better. We need any shred of feedback that we can get to just keep getting better. And whenever you talk about uh, culture, you always have to talk about leadership. And I don't mean a single person as leader. I mean a really a culture of shared leadership. And with that insight, and I really started looking a around Rhode Island, and I just don't see us focusing on that particular variable. We spent a lot of time focusing on statewide leadership, whether it be in Ride or in the State House or whatnot. And of course, we have excellent district level leadership. But the idea to focus on building level leadership and the culture of excellence and continuous improvement that building level leadership creates or doesn't create is not something that I've heard a lot of people talking about. And in fact, when I talk about principles and the principalship, who actually the principal is the person who's entrusted with that leadership role, can't do it alone, absolutely has to do it surrounded by teacher leadership. But when I talk with people about the principal, they say, you know what, we don't pay enough to the principal. Or you know what, it's a lousy job, nobody wants it. Or you know what, they're just not ready for what you envision them to do. Speaking in generalities, of course, we have wonderful principals. But the idea that the principal and his or her leadership team should be at the very core of making our schools just excellent and keep getting better, it's just not receiving, in my opinion, the kind of attention that it should receive. And if you think about it, we have 15,000 teachers. The idea that we can't have 300 amazing principals out of 15,000 teachers is just bizarre to me. We can do it. We just have to talk about it, we have to focus on it, and we have to support principals with meaningful autonomy, meaningful uh, 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 teacher leadership teams to support that work. We just need to focus on it. So again, it's about culture, it's about leadership, it's about empowering people who are closest to the problem that we're trying to tackle, and so on. And I have some very specific ideas that I'd like to go through with you. Last piece, just as a framing remark I'd like to uh, make is we're having a lot of really important conversations about charter schools. And the charter school conversations, they tend to fall into just pre very predictable lines. Some people are for charter schools, some people are against charter schools, and everybody kind of suits up and then we, we do battle over the charter school question. And what I would say is I want to look past that divide because there's, there's real things that the charter schools can do that traditional district schools can't do. And I don't see any reason why we have to keep that divide. I don't see any reason why we can't, if we set our mind to it, give the tools to district schools that charter schools currently have, not to eliminate the charter sector. I'll be very transparent. I think we need the charter sector. It serves an important role. But I want to absolutely address the demand for the charter sector. 
we have lots and lots of people that are on waiting lists for charter schools. We can't pretend like that doesn't exist. So can we, if we set our mind to it, give the tools to district schools so they can actually work in a concerted way to reduce the demand for the charter sector? And that, a lot of ways, what I'm about to uh, uh, lay out for you is driven by that idea. I firmly believe that the answer is not outside of the room. The answer is in the room. We have all of the talent that we need to do even better in our public school system. Absolutely have all the talent. We just need to set the right goals and then work together to make that happen. So the, the, the very shortest version is um, all of this is about teaching and learning. It's about instruction. And there are just certain uh, things that we can do together to improve teaching and learning. We can take a look at, and we've been doing this work for the past five years. We'll continue to do this work. It's about having uh, meaningful and challenging grade level learning expectations for students. It's about having measures of student progress that are comparable across communities. It's about having holding the adults accountable for progress. I personally feel much more comfortable with metrics to hold schools and districts accountable. I think it gets really tricky when you get into those metrics at, at, a, at a, a teacher level. We still have a lot of thoughtful work to do around there. Um, and it's about ongoing professional development to provide support to teachers. It's about leadership preparation programs, teacher preparation programs. It's all about instruction. And that work has existed and will continue to exist. And we're going to work together to make it even better. But there's two particular things that I think can amplify the work of instruction. And um, I've been talking a bit about those two things. The first is just taking a look at how we do schooling. Um, it just seems obvious to me that at least every 200 years, we take a really critical look at the way the, the system is structured. And in a lot of ways, our system is structured for two centuries ago. We built our comprehensive high schools, and they're doing wonderful work to make it work in the 21st century. Teachers and principals and families and students are showing up every day to do amazing work to make the comprehensive high school work in the 21st century. But we have to be honest, it was designed in the 19th century. So what are we going to do to just give people the tools to reimagine how we're doing the work? We focus on graduation rates and dropout rates. And when we look at dropout rates, we look in the 10th or the 11th grade. I'm actually worried about the kids who drop out in third grade or fourth grade because they disengage. We lose them. And then they wait and they drop out again in 10th grade or 11th grade. I don't want to lose any of those kids. And the way to do that is to just reimagine how we're doing schooling, not in a one-size-fits-all way. I'm not a guy who's going to sit down with you and say, I know the one answer, and I just my only job is to convince everybody that my answer is the right answer. That's not at all what I'm about. But what I am about is trying to raise the issues and support people who are closest to the kids, closest to the communities, to help them find the answers while we still have meaningful accountability structures so we know that people are generally on the right track. So I don't care whether it looks like dual and concurrent enrollment for all kids, like we did together the last session. That's wonderful. But there's also great work that's happening in, in AP courses. There's a program out there called International Baccalaureate that is a wonderful program. There's a lot of work that's happening in the arts, in STEAM and STEM, the science and technology, engineering and math and the arts. There's a lot of work that's happening in dual language, where people are learning two languages, K through 12. There's a lot of work that could happen around a seal of biliteracy, where people get a certification that they've achieved a level of comp uh, competency in world languages. There's a lot of wonderful work that's happening in CTE that's really integrating through articulation agreements, workplace type experiences with K-12 experiences. There's a lot of work that's happening with college readiness. All of that work is so important, but there's, there's, we need to leverage the best to really think about student engagement. If I were just had my own school right now, for me, student engagement, the way it comes alive for me is standards-based project and problem-based learning. You give the kids a problem that they have to solve. They can't do it by themselves, so they have to work together. And they need teachers to help guide them. And some of the knowledge they need is in the math area. Some of it's in the science area. Some of it's in the arts. So it becomes integrated. And they have to build something and kind of solve a problem or solve a project or whatever. And then they have to display it 
to their peers. They get feedback. They go back and tweak it. Like that's an example of how we can bring learning alive for kids in the 21st century. And I tell you, that's a whole lot more correlated with the kinds of experiences kids are going to have in the workplace as well as in college. And we talk a lot about soft skills or essential skills. The best way to advance those kinds of skills is to really put students in challenging learning environments and then support them, and they develop those kinds of skills. I think there's a lot of work we can do around advanced coursework as well. Right now, we have about 25% of our kids that get a different kind of advanced course experience in high school, and those kids are identified in seventh or eighth grade as part of the accelerated track. What could we do to really bring those kinds of experiences to all students? Not in a sense that they're all going to pass a test score at a certain point, because there's really value in persisting through difficulty. Even if you don't pass the test, there's value in persisting through that difficulty, because you challenged yourself. You had, to ask, you had to get creative. You had to ask questions. You had to rely on supports. You had to navigate your way through. That's the kind of thing that we can do reimagining schooling, advanced coursework, and then also the personalization that we bring to the table. The other way to really amplify the work of instruction is what I would just call empowerment. We really need to empower the people who are closest to the schools that we're trying to support. Now, one group of those people are the schools, the school empowerment, and I'll talk with you about school empowerment. But we, in my opinion, we can't just do school empowerment if we don't also do family empowerment. We really have to get into the habit of just working at this together as a partnership, families and schools working side by side in a deep way, not in a way that we had a family night or we had a parent night and 5% of our parents showed up or didn't show up, in a much, much deeper way. So very, very specific. Uh, we have um, language that, that we're, we're developing around a uh, potential uh, legislative package that let's just call it a, a school empowerment package. Completely voluntary. Completely voluntary. Even if you folks and the, the general and, and the, the general assembly and everybody in their wisdom finds that we want to do this together, nobody may decide to actually take us up on it because it would be completely voluntary. Because I really believe that if you force people to do it, it's like the Heisenberg principle. If you, if you measure it, you've changed what you're measuring. If you force people to do it, you've changed it. So completely voluntary. And by design, this package, voluntary, would put on the table at the same time the things that literally for the past 40 to 50 years people have been saying, this is what we need to improve our schools. Now, there's different people sometimes. Sometimes what the families have been asking for are different than what the teachers have been asking for, which is different than what the principals may have been asking for. But it's, it's designed to do exactly that. At the same time, put all of the pieces on the table as a package, and it's voluntary, completely voluntary. So everybody gives a little bit, everybody gets a little bit. And that's typically the way compromise works. Everybody gives a little bit, everybody gets a little bit, and you make it voluntary. So what are the four things? What would RIDE give? Uh, what would the state give? We would give what we've been hearing for years, extreme regulatory freedom. Whatever we can waive, we will waive. And the way the, the language is structured, it would literally just list the things that we can't waive, health and safety things, constitutional things, and so on. Anything else, if it's tied to that school needs it in order to accomplish what they want to accomplish, we would waive it. Now, I, I'm very clear that this is not about waiving accountability, but we can abs absolutely talk about the metrics to measure accountability. We have a perfect opportunity to reimagine the metrics that we're using for accountability. I am not looking to just cut off anything goes, no adult responsibility, but it doesn't make sense to me to hold people accountable if we don't give them the autonomy and the authority to actually impact the work that they're doing for which they're being held accountable. So complete flexibility around regulations, anything that we can waive, we would waive. And when I say we, not ride, we would not be approving this. This would be a local process, which I'll talk about in a second. Second thing, what would the school committees and superintendents have to do a little bit differently? And I'm not saying anything to you that I haven't already discussed with uh, teacher leadership, teacher union leadership, teacher leadership, uh, superintendents, principals, school committees, um, business community, philanthropic community, and, and so on. Uh, School committees and superintendents would, would have to give principals and their leadership team autonomy over the school. 
Right now, principals do not have autonomy over the school. They control, because autonomy is budget, right? You either control your budget or you don't. Principals control about 10 to 15% of their budget, which means they don't control their budget. They have a sliver of it, which means they don't. So they would have to have autonomy over their budget. They would get a number, and they would have autonomy over the, that number. And 70% of the budget is personnel, so they would have to have autonomy over hiring. There's no other way to do it. If you really want to hold people accountable for a building, you have to give them autonomy over that building, which means that school committees would, would just have to be what they're supposed to be, which is they're the policy organization. They're the policy board of the organization, and that means that superintendents absolutely critical role. They need to manage a portfolio of schools. They need to manage talent. But give, hire a principal that can get the job done. We know we have capacity gaps. We know that we would have to do a strong leadership push to get the kinds of principals that we would need, you know, or support the existing principals to make sure that they're prepared for this. But autonomy over budget and, and personnel. Now, obviously, that's not going to occur if uh, principals and, and teachers can't work well together. So our process for volunteering for this piece would really be two components. Uh, we're proposing 65% of the teachers would have to be on board or it's just not going to work. So why do it if it's not going to work? So uh, two-thirds of the teachers would have to be on board for this to happen. And of course, the school committees, by statute, are in charge of the schools. So the school committee would have to agree as well. Voluntary, Supermajority of teachers would have to agree either to do it or to stop doing it. School committee would have to agree, and school committees typically delegate responsibilities to the superintendent, so of course the superintendent would be involved and so on. So that's the second component. The third component, uh, the teachers. What would the teachers have to do a little bit differently? And in this voluntary package, uh, we would move to uh, more uh, flexible uh, contract situations. Uh, we're calling it a, a work agreement. And specifically what that would mean is the teachers in the school, this is at the school level, would stay in the, the union, of course. Um, they would continue to get the salary and benefits as defined by the district contract. But uh, pretty much everything else would be done through shared participatory leadership between the principal and the leadership team of the school. It's so between the teachers and the principal. So all of those work roles that, I mean, let's be honest, I, I worked in, in schools for 15 years. Contracts typically evolve through battles. Like, remember that battle in 1976? Well, that produced this clause of the contract because some hotshot administrator had an idea and the teachers had to kind of manage that idea, so it went into the contract. And maybe that hotshot administrator is long gone and nobody really remembers what the battle was, but the, the language lasts. And remember that big one in 1997? Well, that's Section 5 of the contract now. Like, that's the way it, it builds up. Somewhat like scar tissue, and somewhat like scar tissue, it's painful to get rid of it, and it typically gets into the dynamic of givebacks, where, you know, what, what's, what's the trade going to be? So then it just often doesn't happen. So what would it look like if all of that just started fresh? It would not happen in, without the context of trust between the, the faculty the professional faculty and, and the, the principal. But if we had that context of trust, why not? Just like regulatory flexibility can allow people to reimagine how they do their schools, same thing with the, 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 uh, the work rules around the contract. So if people want to reimagine class size so they can invest in literacy coaches, like they could do that kind of thing. If people want to reimagine how professional development works in terms of instructional time versus collaborative time, they could manage that in a way that made sense for their building. If people wanted to reimagine how they're doing family engagement, they want to go into the homes or they want to do it different than just sitting back and waiting, like they could do that. I don't have the answers, but I want to give people the tools so they can come up with the, the, the answers that work in their school. And I'm not making this stuff up. Massachusetts have been doing this kind of thing for at least 20 years. Massachusetts in the 90s did um, strong uh, learning standards, and they stuck to it when the initial news came back as disappointing. And they've, done, they've been doing uh, school-based leadership for 20 years. Um, this, and this is, this is the way, this kind of leadership culture is the way that organizations work. The last component, and this is the one that's raised the most uh, eyebrows, um, is uh, I just don't believe that you can elevate school empowerment without, without also elevating family empowerment. You, you, they just have to be hand in hand. It's like a marriage. It's like a family. Like people just have to be in it together. 
it, 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 it amazes me when people say, you know, we have a great school. And I say, well, how do you know you have a great school? And they'll say this or that or whatever. And people often don't like test scores unless they like test scores. And then they'll say, because of our test scores or whatever. They'll say, we have a great school. I say, how do you know that you have a great school if people aren't free to leave? Like, how do you know? And they'll say, well, they could move. Well, all right, people could move, but it's kind of difficult to move. So, like, why do we have to keep a system where people are literally, like, locked in the gates? And if we just start thinking about it, like, what might it look like if a school serves its residents first, but then if they have extra seats? They have extra seats, and they have the interest why couldn't they open their doors and open it up to inter-district choice, district to district? And if we just could create a little bit of space, then maybe we would just create some space for some innovative practices, things that just can't currently occur right now. Not that I can dream up what should happen, but they can dream up what should happen and so on. I'll give you a couple of examples. But specifically the way it would work, totally voluntary. The, the school empowerment piece voluntary, the open enrollment piece voluntary. The local community would say, we've got extra space, we want to open the doors. Um, there's some risks, so the way we would manage those risks is you could set admission criteria for the program. The admissions criteria would have to be tied to the program that you want to open up. So if you want to open up a, an ex, a art design program, then you could have admissions criteria to that program that were tied in a non-discriminatory way to an art design program. If you wanted to open up an accelerated computer science program, same thing, you could have admissions criteria. So it could be a rational set of admissions criteria, but could not be discriminatory you know, for protected reasons and, and so on. And then transportation, the way we're proposing it is, if the student wants to go to a different district and it's available. So the way this could work is the, the parents, the families would have an affirmative right to leave the school but they may actually have nowhere to go unless somebody decides to open their doors because they have the capacity and the interest. So there's a lot of things that would slow this down. Most people want to go to their neighborhood school. Most people don't want to leave their neighborhood school. So transportation, if the student wanted to go to a school in the same transportation region, then the transportation would be covered by the receiving school through the dollars following the students. Um, and, and obviously this isn't going to go anywhere if you don't think that we... Uh, propose a, a viable fix to the funding formula issues. But the dollars would follow the students district to district and transportation would be covered within the region by those dollars. If the student wanted to go to a, a school in a transportation region outside of that region, the student would have to be responsible for transportation. Again, there's a lot of things designed to just slow this down and, and, and so on. So let, let me give just uh, three examples of things that just might become possible if, if we were to go in this direction. First is um, student mobility. About one-third of student mobility occurs in our urban districts, about one-third. And if you talk to a teacher in an urban community about some of the biggest issues that they struggle with in order to do right by their kids, They'll talk about mobility. They'll talk about students that move within the school year, multiple times between school years and so on. All the, the trauma and drama, personal, academic, that occurs when that, that dis, discontinuity occurs in a child's life. Whether the, the instruction wasn't aligned or the family is just in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bad spot or whatever. And one-third of our mobility occurs in, that con in the urban context. And that's the biggest complaint, one of the biggest complaints that teachers talk about. And our urban schools are contiguous with each other. Central Falls, Pawtucket, and Providence are contiguous with each other. Sometimes, literally, the kid might have moved two miles down the road. They might be able to see their old house, and we, the adults, force them to go to a different school. We create, as adults, we create one of the biggest issues that we're struggling with in our urban schools. We've created, we can, we can fix this. We can, we can just allow the student to stay in their school even if, if they move. And it's not just an urban phenomenon. You think about any of you or your friends who's, you wanted to move in ninth grade and your, your daughter or your son was just horrified by the idea of starting over. Again, could we just give a little bit of space for some interesting things to happen that currently just can't happen? Next example, uh, school for the deaf. 
Just, it's just a, a, a small example, but I think it applies in lots of different contexts. School for the Deaf is a small school. They serve about 80 kids. They are a bilingual school. They see themselves as a bilingual school. They teach American Sign Language and English. Out of their 80-so students, maybe they have 30 kids that have siblings. And those siblings might want to learn American Sign Language, too, so they can communicate with their brother or their sister. Believe me, it happens that families can't communicate with each other. I have a sister-in-law who's deaf, and her siblings can't communicate with her because they did not have the same kind of quality exposure to American Sign Language. So they would love, they have extra seats, they would love to take in kids, siblings of deaf students, so they could help them learn American Sign Language. They can't do that currently. Now, yes, they could form bilateral tuition agreements with all of the sending districts, but there's about 30 different sending districts. That's a lot of bureaucratic work. We could single-handedly allow for that to be taken care of. We could make that happen. Now, so then people say, well, why don't we just legislate that the school for the deaf, if they have seats, can take in siblings? Because that's just one example that I've thought of. I guarantee there's a dozen examples out there that we haven't thought of, that people aren't even thinking of because they currently don't have the flexibility. So let, let me just pause there and we can really uh, get into the idea. But at a, at a really fundamental level, I really believe that we can... And I, I met with a group of teachers. There's a group called RITAC, which is a, a legislative entity that was created um, in different times that requires the commissioner to meet with a group of teachers. And I love it. I love having the opportunity to talk with them. And I met with them, and we, I laid out the pitch. I wanted their feedback. And they, they looked at me at the end, and a number of the teachers teach in urban communities. They looked at me at the end. They said, you know what, Ken? If you just proposed open enrollment without giving me any tools to do my job differently, you'd be killing me. You'd be cutting the legs out from under me. Everyone would leave our school. And they gave some examples. People would just leave. But, and this is from teachers, I'm quoting, but if you give me the tools to build the schools that we think are best for our kids, we can build schools that nobody will want to leave. That's the dynamic that I want to try to help create. It's about leadership. It's about collaborative processes between teachers and administrators and families. I want to give them the tools so people can build environments that nobody will want to leave. And if we can do that, we don't have to fight over charter schools versus district schools because the demand for charters will go down because districts can meet that demand. They have the talent. We have the talent in our schools. We just have to unleash it. I'll stop. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Commissioner, for spending the time, and um, I think, certainly appreciate your approach as you've been to the state, sort of taking a listen first, so I appreciate that. Um, I'm not an educator, so I'm a former school committee member. I'm a finance guy by trade, so uh, probably about 50% of what's talked about here goes right over my head, um, and people like the chair or Senator Satchel will, will understand more of the education stuff. Um, but what I have learned, um, I would agree with you wholeheartedly around building leadership, and so I represent Cumberland and Lincoln. Um, and so I'm thankful to have the best principal in America uh, in Cumberland. And um, I think that was really, you know, his decision to be in Cumberland, and obviously speaking for him, but I think his decision in a series of educators was based around who that superintendent was. And I think they created a high energy culture that attracted others to work with them. And as someone who sat in a school committee at a period of time where I think the leadership was horrible, um, you can certainly see from every level of the ground level for students and classrooms through the relations with the school community superintendent that it is dramatically different. So I, I just want to say I completely agree on, on your thoughts around leadership um, in our schools. Where I would challenge, um, and I think there's a, this is a debate that challenged, that really uh, went after our session last year and is coming back up quickly, is this charter versus traditional debate. And I would disagree that it's a typical charter versus traditional debate, because I don't think that's what it is at all. And um, I think what we have set up in the way that the state has set up the funding form and the way that we've done it is we've created a math problem mm -hmm. that is causing the tension that exists that is often um, not about at all the, the outcomes or the education or the achievement gaps or what you're trying to achieve with the charter. It's not all about that. It's about purely much of the resources, right? 
And so as we've begun to think about this and we started pulling a lot of the data apart and other things, when you start looking at these actual districts and you start looking at the Pawtuckets and the Providences and the Woonsockets and in my communities, Cumberland and Lincoln, what you will see is what we thought we passed in the funding formula, uh, and not me because I wasn't here, so it predated me, but what was, thought, what was thought we passed in the funding formula was equity among districts and that all students had the same funding and that uh, the correlation between uh, ELL students and students in poverty and students with special needs was so correlated to the free and reduced lunch that we were going to have a student success factor. When you actually look at the data, those, there's eight districts that are not getting that core amount today and will never get there, uh, absent some dramatic changes to the way we look at the system. And ironically, much of the charter sector has drawn from those very districts, creating a core education amount to be different in and of itself, right? So we talk a lot about achievement gaps and we talk about how we want to do that. And I agree, that's what the conversation needs to be on. But too often we have this, this rigid view that it's, you know, achievement gaps, you know, charters are the only ones that can improve achievement gaps. And I just don't agree with that, right? Mm -hmm. and, they, mm -hmm. and you look at, in those eight districts that I mentioned that are not getting the core funding, that's where 78% of the state's ELL population is. 59% yep. of the students in poverty and 45% of the students with special needs are in those eight districts. So if we don't start addressing those eight districts and the core funding problems they have, it will never get better. And I think the conversation we need to have is a larger conversation about how do we improve student achievement overall and particularly, how do we remove this charter tuition issue from local communities? Because it's just making their core problem yeah. worse. Yeah, yeah I, I, think, I think we uh, l largely agree. Um, I very much want to give the tools to Pawtucket, Central Falls, Providence, so they don't lose kids. I want to give them those tools. And, and, and it includes giving up some of my own authority to give them those tools. And I really uh, believe that wrapped up in those tools is the kind of leadership talent that, that you mentioned, like Alan provides in his school, so we can Im improve instruction. Um, I met with the uh, D Dyslexia Commission yesterday, and you, you, can't, you can't think of a, a, a clearer situation where, like, there's, there's an instructional answer. Students who have differing levels of struggling with reading in complicated different ways. Like it's not just a proficiency or not proficiency. Dyslexia is much more complicated than that. Some students have issues with fluencies. Some students have issues with decoding, phonemic awareness, whatever it might be. And we had a really good conversation. And there is a science on how to approach specific reading difficulties. There's a science to it. But where we landed in that conversation, and I think I'm fairly representing it, is until you create that kind of cohesive instructional culture where people are just hungry to make sure every student does just as well as they possibly can be. Like we're, we're, we're wasting our time even with professional development because we're going to give a one-size-fits-all professional development that doesn't meet the real needs of teachers. But when teachers tell us the PD that they need and they have the authority to create and support the kinds of PD experiences, then we'll really make instructional improvement. So I absolutely want those eight districts to be supported just as much as we can. I, I just believe that the way to support those districts is to really give them the kind of empowerment structures that, that we're talking about. I do not believe we have a workforce problem in Rhode Island. I believe we have a leadership challenge and we have a structural challenge. And I'm proposing that we address both of those. Madam Chair, if I can just follow up on that. Do you want to continue? If I can. Go ahead. Um, so I 100% agree with you on tools. Mm -hmm. Tools is a great thing, and giving, I don't disagree with anything you said, but what I would tell you is this, is when you look at the actual numbers of what we're, and I'll give you this deck that we have here so you can look at this later, and I know we're, we've been trading time to meet together. When you look at these numbers, and Pawtucket students are being shortchanged, $3,500 a kid, or $35 million, Providence, $61 million, Cumberland, $6.8 million. Regardless of the freedom we give, if the money's not there to support the math interventionists that you need. The money's not there to support the after-school program. I mean, the money's not there to have the ELL program you need. It won't work, right? And so the debate that we, we have, I think there's a, there's a, to me anyway, this is a fundamental foundation mm -hmm. that if you can't even, if you don't have the, the resources as far as cash to compete, mm -hmm. doesn't matter, gotcha. right? And I think that's, there's just one piece I don't want to lose in the conversation that at that we decided to have a core instruction amount so that every student had their equity, we need to make sure they actually have it, yep. or we need to tear that core instruction amount back apart and say, 
Why do they not work? Gotcha. So I'll leave you with this because I Please. probably haven't seen it, and I'll give it to that. Um, and thank you, Madam Chair, for your indulgence. Absolutely. Thank so you. we have the banker's take on things. Yeah, I'm a finance but I, guy, not an education <laughs> guy. I wanted to touch on the, the uh, dyslexia because yes. um, I do consider that a very important um, aspect of education because I agree with you. If children cannot read by the third grade, they are going to check out and they are going to drop out eventually or become a behavior problem. Mm -hmm. What are your feelings on, and I've been thinking about this for a while, I've been mulling it about, having a um, dyslexia charter school mm. or special school. Um, people could perhaps bid on it. Mm -hmm. um, so much the same as we have a school for the deaf, yeah. we could have a school for dyslexia so that those children could be immersed all day long. It would be statewide, and they could have the autonomy that you're talking about. The money would follow the child. What do you think of that? Yeah, I, I think I, I met a, a woman yesterday at the commission meeting, and she had to send her child to Buffalo uh, to get the kind of help that she felt <coughs> her child needed. Uh, I think it's a very interesting idea that we, we absolutely um, should talk through. My only concern would be I think that there's stuff that we need to do for all schools to help them understand the challenge of specific reading difficulties and address those challenges. But there likely will be a, a sizable number of students who really do need a unique learning environment to address that. And a specific school could potentially help address that. Um, we, we, we very much welcome having that conversation. And I know it, it, it's complicated. I, I know, like, as far as Cranston, we're very involved. They did a lot of professional development for Wilson training, yeah. um, which uh, alleviates a lot of the problems. But, I mean, that's probably 90% of the students, but they're still like that yeah. 10%. But I think most schools, and I'm only familiar with Cranston, but I know that they do um, do the professional development, and they are doing Wilson, and they do um, different... Um, reading programs for children. But I think it might be something that we might want to explore going forward. Sure. Senator. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Commissioner, thank you for coming today and sharing your thoughts. Uh, it's sort of like stepping into a whole new environment in terms of having a new commissioner, uh, new thoughts and new ideas. And uh, it's, uh, it's sort of like uh, being in a church where you have the spiritual leader and then you have the Board of Trustees that raise the money. And I look at what we do here in the legislature as we're, we're the trustees in terms of the money part of it. Mm -hmm. So we put together the budget. And uh, certainly there are some issues with the funding formula. But I, I do have to comment, and this is before your time and before some of the other senators' time, there was a tremendous amount of work that went into that funding formula and the way it was developed. And there was a lot of sweat, blood, and tears to develop that. And while we've learned, things have changed, so it's not perfect. And th we need to change with the times, like you're talking about changing with the times. So, uh, you know, there's legislation, I believe, has already been introduced, and we need to take a look at that. And we need to tweak the, uh, the formula, make, maybe make some significant changes. Uh, but uh, I look at you as more the spiritual leader rather than <laughs> the Board of Trustees handling the financial things. So hopefully we can work with you and give you the tools that you need to be successful. So, uh, but I was very encouraged by your words and thank you for being here. Yeah. And there's really some great work that came out of the Funding Formula Work Group and we look forward to you know, working through the session to, to get it right. Uh, Senator Palma. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner, thank you for being here. So I have one specific question and one more, a little more general after that. And I think I have it in my desk. I, mean, I don't have it here. I believe Providence has school choice today. I think the application you fill out when you, mm -hmm. when you sign your child up for whatever grade it is, you pick, you identify your four, three, I'll make it up, three or four choices. And I think at the time it was one of the charter schools or mayoral academies, whatever's, whatever's on the list. And I realize you've only been here a year. Uh, so the, over, the honeymoon phase is over. Uh, it's time to, uh, we're moving on from that phase. What, what, is, what has Providence learned or not learned? And I understand and appreciate some of the challenges Providence has, and it's also a case of, uh, so we talk about teacher equity. And I, I had to wrap my head around that when I went down to a, a conference effect with Marianne and company about teacher equity. It's like, well, no, it's student, but it's really, it's teacher equity in the eyes of the student, right? Uh, 
And if Senator Metz was here, he would say, your education shouldn't be gated on the zip code that you live in. So Providence has had that for a number of years. Like I said, the, the uh, black dot application I have in my office is at least three or four years old. What have we learned from that, and what's different with what we're thinking about yeah. here? So my, my takeaway from that, and um, the interim superintendent, Chris Maher, is, is doing great work to keep, keep Providence moving forward. But my take on that is um, you can't do this stuff piecemeal. You, you can't just tweak like this or that. The four dimensions that I laid out actually have to hang together because if you have school choice but you don't have regulatory flexibility, like it falls apart. If you have school choice but you don't have leadership and leadership team autonomy, it, it falls apart. But so, isn't there one Providence school that did that? I, yep. I was wondering how it was doing. Yeah. So, there's one that had complete autonomy, didn't it? Well, so there's autonomy and there's autonomy. Um, <laughs> but even in that instance, even where there was uh, an unprecedented level of autonomy at the district level, the state wasn't you know, in on it in terms of really offering up some of the regulatory flexibility. So I would say, yes, Providence has done some things that we can learn from, including looking at things like flexibility around contracts, including looking at things like enrollment flexibility. It's still intra-district choice. It's not inter-district choice. And they've also done some reimagining schooling work with uh, the high school, high school 360 and, and so on with some teacher and student design teams. So they've done a lot of the things that we can learn from. But what I'm su you know, suggesting is if we do it together and we don't just try to learn from Providence, but we try to learn from anyone that wants to take us up on the offer, why not give them the option to take us up on the offer? If, if, so the follow-up up on that, and I'll get to the second part. The looking at the, the four components that you identified, and that's that's important to do. And we always think about, and we all say this. I try to take a, take a fair amount of time to spend thinking about what are the unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. So we know what the intended consequences are: student performance. At the end of the day, it comes down to one basic thing for everything: the student improves because of what we're doing. All right, it, it, we ha we have to be able to shape it into something that. It can't be 17 things. It's what's the one thing that, at the end of the day, I'll just say it from an engineering perspective, I can measure. That we know whether we're moving down the path or not, and it's, it's student performance. Uh, so in light of that, and everything you've laid out I think is phenomenal. I really do. Uh, the challenge I would have is, and the question for you, if you're able to do one thing, it's, it, I don't want to say we're fixing a system. We're, re or, as you said, we're working to reimagine the system. If you were to do one thing first, what's the one thing that you'd want 15,000 teachers, 300 principals, and I think we have about 140, 150,000 students. Is that about right? Mm -hmm. I think it's in that number. What's the one thing that, if you were to focus on that, and so that student performance, at the end of the day, it, it's, it's about parents, grandparents, teachers, principals, all of us want to ensure that students are getting a better education, getting the, excuse me, not a better, the best education they can through their abilities and where they are. What's the one thing we need to do, should do, can do as the first thing that would rally 150,000 students, 15,000 teachers, 300 principals, and several hundred thousand parents? It, it would, we're, we're in a really um, huge opportunity that um, coming following a period of unprecedented efforts in education, you're, you have a new commissioner who's coming in and is largely saying, I agree with you, let's do it. People have been asking for empowerment. People have been asking for autonomy for a very long time. If I could pick one thing, I would say let's give people a choice to figure out if this parent, if this family and school empowerment package makes sense in their local context. Let's give them that option. Let's have a vote in the state house so people have a vote in the school house. Let's give them that option. And what that would do, and, and there's, 
What that would do is you'd have your, your system over here, which is everybody doing what everybody's doing right now. And we'll continue to push within that system. We're going to continue to focus on professional development, continue to focus on leadership preparation, continue to focus on all of those things. And then over here, on this side of the screen, you'd have, well, this school's doing this, and this school's doing this, and this school's doing this. We would have, just like in, in, in your economic development work, the way economic development work happens is you create space for innovation, and then you empower the people, give them the tools to do things they can't currently do. What I would propose is we take that wonderful economic development work in, in last year, we poured it over into this year, and we create an opportunity for this school to try this, this school to try this. And when things start to work, we live in a media age now when st things start to work. People want to do it. People want to try it and so on. And then we could really have an atmosphere where if something doesn't work, it just goes away really quickly. But if something does work, then other people can start to try it. That would be my one thing. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. Wagner, uh, Senator Palma asked about the, the unintended consequences of the, this choice movement, and he mentioned Providence and how they have the, the interdistrict choice in Providence. I'm worried about the unintended consequences of a place like West Warwick when we're in a five-year fiscal stability plan, and you know we have local leaders that are worried about the tipping fees at the dump going up. How are we going to be able to stabilize our five-year plan to account for that? And now with this, the possibility of this plan coming through, you know, we, we run the risk as, you know, we, we, for all intents and purposes, are an urban population. We were labeled as a core urban district, and then all of a sudden we got dropped from that label. You know, we, we could be in a situation where we see an exodus of students. Yeah. Are there any discussions going on? Do you have any contingencies in mind where if there is a problem like this in a town like West Warwick that's fiscally in trouble or a town like West Warwick where this choice movement has the potential to destabilize the overall financial situation of the town? Are there plans in place or has there been discussion about how RIDE will step in and help to both help the town stay stable and help these kids to have their choice? Yeah. So it, it's a absolute great question. And even though I said we're not proposing that RIDE approve these things, that these things would be approved at the local level, because it's not our version of empowerment, we are proposing that RIDE has a, a shutoff potential if something's going horribly wrong. Um, whether on the school side or, or whatnot. So I think that's an important point, and I made myself a note just to make sure that it, it stays in there. The other thing, though, like, and this is always, this is always happens, where, where on one side you can see risk, there's also the potential to see opportunity. And what I would say that if a person in West Warwick is concerned about the risk, I would ask them at least to consider the potential opportunities, which is, you folks just are at the top of your game, and maybe this is a way to help address your dwindling enrollment issue in a way that doesn't, um, doesn't you know, pillage your neighbors, but in a way that really serves in, in, in a complementary way. Because in, in some ways, and I've said this to the charter sector, in some ways the charter sector actually has the most to lose in this idea. Because right now the charter sector has a, a corner on the, 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 the choice you know, market. If anybody wants choice right now, there's only two places they can go. They can go to the charter sector and also CTE. We currently have CTE that's statewide. But that's it. So with what I'm proposing, West Warwick might actually be able to create, and I believe that you folks have the talent to create, things that other people would want to go to. So you might lose some because somebody else has this kind of innovative program, but you might actually, might actually gain more than you lose. And you've got people right across the river, East Providence, they're bursting at the seams. So there might actually be some opportunities for some win-wins to happen. So I, I would just question the assumption that this kind of idea is a net loss. If anything, I'm trying to give people the tools so it actually could be a net gain. And people really get, because when we say one size doesn't fit all and we say it in the assessment context, I agree. But one size also doesn't fit all in the school context. There really are differences. Chair, to your point about dyslexia, there really are differences, and this might just create some space for those differences. I agree. Uh, so I have a question. Um, so, Commissioner, 
we know that charter schools have after-school programs, which parents absolutely love. They have the full day K. Would the schools then have the ability to raise money the way charter schools can raise money from um, out of the district? They would be able to raise money for, say, like an after-school program so that the children could stay in school until 5 o'clock? That, that's a great question. And that, that goes exactly to the point. Like, I, I won't think of all these things, but your, your wheels are turning and you're thinking about They always after, turn. And they're, they're, <laughs> they're thinking about after-school programs. And I met with the, um, I met with, uh, the uh, BIF folks, the Business Innovation Factory folks, and, and their like, eyes lit up. And they said, oh, this, this, this is what they said is, Ken, you know, we have people who want to partner with schools. They want to. They believe in their community. They believe in their schools. But right now the risk is just a little bit too, it's, it's, it's vague because they don't know exactly who they're partnering with. Are they partnering with the region? Are they partnering with the state? Are they partnering with the district? But they said if you can parse it down that this school actually has the kind of flexibility and autonomy that you're talking about, that dramatically reduces the investment risk for a philanthropic partner or a business partner because they know exactly what they're getting and what they're not getting because they know where the accountability lies, where the authority lies, where the flexibility and autonomy lies. So I would suggest, and it was really their suggestion, and they said people like us can help serve as a broker for people who want to do this and people who want to support this. So I would say absolutely, if a school wants to really build upon you know, there's a lot of work around um, uh, community schools where schools start to offer health services or after-school program services. This is the perfect space where you could find those partnerships, school partnerships, to, to, to build those kinds of programs. You know, that doesn't mean that the rest of the district suffers because, first of all, every school in the district could have the same flexibility if they want it. But success breeds success. Like when people start seeing things working, then more people want to make it continue to work. So all it would take is one school that really cracks the nut and how to fund and support a high quality after school program and then and then it'll 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 grow it, it has the potential to expand. Yes, thank you, Commissioner. Good good to see you. I I apologize. I had to vote in another committee, so I wanted to get here, but just in, if you already covered it, just please excuse me, but one of the testimonies that I heard and it was some people from my district, and they and this is about parent engagement. And what the mother said, or the aunt, there was two, there was two, uh, two guardians, two parents, and they didn't do so well in one school, but when they went to the charter, they did well. And it really stuck with me. One of the one of the ladies said, "It's not that I didn't want to help my child; I just didn't know how." Mm -hmm. So this particular school that they went to train the parents to be able to help the kids with the, whatever it was. So what type of, uh, if you covered it, please excuse me, but uh, I'm, I, I was very interested in, in her comments because she was there advocating for the schools where her kids were doing well. Yeah, yeah, I think um, I, I, I totally agree with you that our effort to support schools has to go hand in hand with our efforts to support and empower families. And um, I, I would just suggest that the, uh, it's an outgrowth of, of leadership culture. When, when uh, the leadership culture of a school, and when I say leadership culture, I mean the principal coupled with his or her teacher leadership team, when they believe that they will be more successful if they truly engage with families, they will make it a priority to fully engage with families and they will figure out how to do it. And I actually just want to make it easier for them to figure out how to do it. So, for example, if they want to have one fewer instructional day because they want to do some sort of parent academy over the course of a day, like they should have that kind of flexibility if that's what makes sense in their local context. If they want to do an alternate instructional environment so their teachers can go to a workplace environment or go to a home environment to fully engage with the families, they should have those kinds of opportunities and flexibilities. If we view family engagement as we call in our school calendar, we post parent night, and then we sit back in our offices and lament that only 2% of the parents show up, we will never get serious about family engagement. If we think out of the box about how to do it and we give people the tools and flexibility to do what they want, 
then, then we can really transform parent and family engagement. I'm sorry also for arriving late, and um, so I'll only comment based on uh, Senator Gallo's point on um, uh, advantaging some of the resources within the community, and will that be um, part of what the flexibility that you're discussing? Is there a concern that that may lead or exaggerate some of the disparities that already exist from one community to another or one part of a community to one another part of a community where um, resources are already scarce? And so, therefore, the ability to um, have either a community interest or a outside the community interest in investing in that school or the interest within the community may be less because of the income disparities that exist in the yeah. community. So could the kind of flexibility you're talking about at least initially exaggerate the disparities that already exist? Yeah. So because this is designed to go very slowly, and if you ask me, like, Ken, if, if we did this, how many, I'd be looking at, like, five schools in the first year, so very, and with, with, with planning and design grants, so people really would be thoughtful about it. So this, this is by design to go very slowly. So nothing, like, if I got a phone call from 200 schools, like, we want to do this, I'd say, no, 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 you don't want to do this. We want to, we want to see what works and what doesn't work. So going slowly can help with unintended consequences that were raised before. I actually want to give uh, schools an opportunity to, to really, not in a winners and losers way, but a way to grow programs. Like when was the last time we talked to an urban school principal and said, we want to help you grow your program? Most urban school principals are just petrified about keeping their program going. I want to actually help people grow the program. And then the last thing is when we talk about disparities, there's actually very uh, noticeable and persistent within district disparities that actually already occur. Because I mentioned before about 70% of the budget is, is often payroll. Schools currently do not get their per student allocation. They don't. What happens is districts get the total amount of money and they redistribute the money in some ways largely to cover payroll. So there's actually disparities within districts just like outside of districts. So I just want to help give people the tools to address those, those issues. Senator De Palma. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thinking more about the, I'll say, the expanded school choice piece and then a way we potentially fund it. One of the, thank you, Madam Chair. One of the challenges we've heard and we've seen, uh, having been here in, in my eighth year now, from a charter school perspective, is about the opt-in or opt-out kind of thing. So parents, going back to this, too, the Senator Metz was saying, with regards to parent engagement. So that parent initially had the wherewithal, I'll say, to have that child go to whatever school that was, assume it's a charter school or some other school, whatever. They somehow got made that, made that decision. Not all children's parents make those decisions or have the wherewithal to make those decisions or aren't appreciate, don't appreciate necessarily why that would be a good decision for them or not a good decision. I'm just, so when looking at some of the inter-district kind of stuff that you're talking about, would a model be more of a you need to opt out instead of an opt-in and the, I'll say a corollary to that then becomes, do you then run the, do we then run the risk of, uh, I'll say what Senator Pearson uh, faces in from a Cumberland area, of number of students that want to go there, so they're taken from here and it's, not that we're, we're moving the shell around, but we're moving, it, so we're just moving the problem. So the unintended consequence there is it's moving somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah, what I would say actually is I actually don't want people to change schools. I actually don't. I want them to be able to change schools, but I don't want them to change schools because in, when they're able to change schools, it just keeps us all on our toes coupled with school empowerment so then we can create those kinds of compelling but I guess the, learning sorry, environments. Commissioner, but the, sorry to interrupt you, but I did anyway. The other piece about it is we're only talking five schools in the beginning. Right? So it's going to happen for some of it. Or maybe that's not going to be the inter-district inter inter -district stuff. That's just the school empowerment piece. So it's going to manifest itself right away. Because the challenge we have then is, so five out of, so that's one-sixth of one percent, right? Or a little less than that. One, uh, it's about, if there's 300 schools, right? 
Hmm? Dirty schools would be 10 percent. We're talking 1.6 percent or so of schools. What are we saying to the other? It was about no, yeah, 99, 98.4. <laughs> yeah. Or I was, I was really trying to look at number of teachers or number of yep. students or number of parents that are saying, "Hey, what about me?" Yep. So the way the way um, family networks work is most people most people don't. It doesn't matter how affluent you are or how educated you are. Most people don't do comprehensive research on on a particular problem. Most people talk to their network, and. Um, when you talk to family networks, they have definite opinions about their schools. And most people really like their local schools. You, that, that's true nationally. It's true locally. Most people don't like other people's schools, but they like their schools. And that's just a phenomenon that we've seen forever. I do not anticipate there will be – most people want to go to their neighborhood schools. I do not anticipate that there will be this dramatic demand that everybody suddenly wants to shuffle around. Literally what I'm just trying to do is just create some space – for innovative things to happen that currently just don't have the space to happen. And it's, su it's such a, a, a factor that people actually aren't even imagining what those innovations would be, and, and the, example I, the, the examples that I gave before. But I do not believe that suddenly droves of people are going to say, I want to go to a different school. I do think that coupled with school empowerment, like in some ways this is a, a, long, a long game approach, but in some ways, this is actually a very short game approach because I've talked with teachers that if you tell them that in September they can do their building differently, they would love that. And they have very specific ideas about what they would do differently. So in some ways, the transformation can happen in September, but in some ways, the long haul transformation is just the way it is. It just takes a long time to get to that continuous culture of improvement. So I, I preach. It's like, I just give one example. Sure, it's like the starfish example. You know the, the, the parable, the guy who's throwing starfish into the ocean and somebody comes up and says, there's so many of them, why are you even bother, bothering? And he picks up the starfish and he throws it in. And he says, well, it mattered to him. Like, we can change kids' lives now, but the system is going to just take some time to really have the innovation and leadership culture work its way through. I want to be appreciative of the time, but just to follow up on that piece, so we've seen it from a charter perspective. So I'm, I'm, I believe everything you're saying, and I believe this is going to work. So those five schools that are doing this are going to be the Mecca. They're going to be where people want to go to. There'll be waiting lists for folks to want to go there. So we're, the part of it is, and let's, let's assume they are successful. Why would we do it otherwise, right? And we'll measure ourselves along the way, and we'll be accountable to doing what we're doing. So you will have these waiting lists for parents and students to want to go there to raise student performance to the best of their ability uh, as quick as possible. If we're doing five, and this is the answer, what about the other yeah. so that, 195 schools that are saying, hey, what about us? That's an interesting question, and I've gotten it a few times. Like, if this is the answer, then why not make everybody do it? And my re make everybody do it. All right, but why not? And my response would be, we, we, don't, we haven't even tried this. We don't know if it's going to work. So I'm, I'm inherently like a, you know, let's... So let's give it a try. I do believe that if this does start to work, it could be five schools in the first year, then it might be ten schools in the second year. I do want to clarify, though, a school could be an empowerment school but not choose to open their doors. Like, that may not be right for that school, and it really is about the local decision. So a school could be an empowerment school that's going to do things differently, but they, they're not an open enrollment school, or they could be both. If you're a, a, let me pick on Cumberland for just if I may. If you're one of the Cumberland schools that's losing students, Absolutely, you're going to say, bring them on in. Why? Okay. Because it, because it comes down to, unless we solve that money issue, as Senator Pearson and Senator Satch and others have been working on, and Senator Gallagher for a extended period of time now, we're just, just that problem of, that we have today, that unintended consequence. The funding form, I think, is good. It needs to be modified, needs to be changed mm -hmm. to address for all the nothings in the periphery, for all those dials that can be turned. It will just manifest itself somewhere else. Yep, yep. So, so you're absolutely right. We, we, we have to address people's concerns around the funding formula. Abs I absolutely agree with you. However, I just want to caution us not to assume that the arrow is unidirectional. Like, if this, this is really about investing in our, our, our districts and our district schools, I'm assuming the arrows will be bidirectional because this school will do this really well and this school will this do, do this really well. And believe me, people are not sitting on hundreds of extra seats. Warwick is a, West Warwick is an example of having more 
open enrollment, and they're going through some really tough uh, decisions locally. But most people are not sitting on 100 extra seats. They might be sitting on five seats or 10 seats. We do not have a lot of excess seats, and those communities that do have excess seats are in the process of thinking about schools. So I'm really just talking about opening up the space a little bit for some innovative things to happen and to elevate family empowerment while we elevate school empowerment. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Pearson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So kind of interesting to your thoughts around school empowerment and principal empowerment, teacher empowerment. Uh, you made a comparison point to Massachusetts earlier around mm -hmm. uh, the, the standards and, and how they've measured themselves over the years. And clearly, I think we'd love to be Massachusetts when it comes to education. So maybe are you drawing so for some of this stuff around empowerment at school level, building level, you're drawing some comparisons to things that have worked in Massachusetts and yeah. maybe what's worked in Massachusetts well and maybe what hasn't worked in Massachusetts, maybe we don't want to repeat. Yeah. Um, so, so yes, we're, we are looking at Massachusetts. Now, Massachusetts is, it cuts both ways. They have uh, funding issues that are a little bit different than ours, not necessarily in, in the total amount, but uh, definitely uh, there's differences in terms of the state portion of the amount versus the local portion of the amount. Now, it's all taxpayers, so it's all coming from taxpayers, but when the state portion is higher, then the state has more tools to kind of smooth out the differences between communities. So absolutely there's some differences there. But Massachusetts, for the past 20 years, has been doing higher standards work uh, long before you know, the Common Core came along and, and, and so on, and they stuck to it, which is, the, the, that's, the, that's the, the lesson from higher standards. You have to stick to it. I've tried very hard to just lower the temperature around tests and so on, so we could just stick to the instructional work and not fight over you know, the, the evaluation or, or test work. So they did that. They did school empowerment uh, in an in a important way. To my taste, it's a little more bureaucratic than I would like. The state is more involved in Massachusetts empowerment than otherwise. And they also have interdistrict choice, again, in a slightly more uh, uh, bureaucratic way. That you actually have to apply to become an interdistrict choice school, and it's kind of a privilege, a designation. I actually want to give choice options to, peop to schools that traditionally would be considered lower performing because I want to give them kind of the tools to grow their programs. So there's some differences, but, but they've, they've done this kind of work. And it's also a leadership culture. If you, you know, just peruse the leadership journals, a lot of these themes are in, in just leadership literature, not just in the school sector. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. How would you choose which five schools would get I that wouldn't. chance? That's the beauty of it. I Who wouldn't would? choose. Who would? They would. I'm serious about empowerment. I, no, I'm saying no, there wouldn't just be five. Say there's 10 schools yep. that apply that want to be choice. There's no application. So how do you, who, who does it? Yep. So, so this is one of the things that um, actually the uh, union leadership surfaced very early on because in some ways uh, this idea floated a few years ago. It was something called a Vanguard uh, proposal. And one of the reasons why at the time uh, the union didn't feel uncomfortable with it, I think I'm representing this correctly, was because Ride would have been the designee of who got the privilege and who didn't get the privilege. And there was a concern that I actually sympathize with that then we would impose our vision of what it should look like as opposed to really respecting the local voice of what it should look like. So this proposal by design is we would not choose it, there would be a local process. I pretty much outlined it for you. The school committee would have to agree because they, by statute, own the school. And the teachers would have to agree because they, if, if they're not on board, it's not going to work. And we have a two-thirds thing. If, if they do that, and then we would put out regs about like what a plan should look like, what you have to articulate your mission and your financial plan and those kinds of things. But it would be approved at the local level, and we would not be involved other than trying to support the work and trying to make connections and so on. What I did mention before, we are proposing that we would have a, a shutoff if something was going horribly wrong. We, would, we should have the ability to shut it off, but we're even wording it in extreme circumstances. So this really is about local empowerment. So there could be a lot more than five. Yeah, but I don't, people have questions, people haven't done the planning. How do you line up two-thirds of your teachers to want to do something that sounds like science fiction? It's going to, there's going to be but some But now, time. what's that school in Providence? Because I remember a Cranston social worker going to a school in Providence where the principal was able to select every um, faculty member and had complete autonomy. As far as I remember, do you know the name of the school? Yeah. So I'm not sure of the... Chamber. Well, 
No, not hope. So, so there's, yeah. Pleasant view. Okay. So, so there's there's two experimental high schools. Because I'd love to know how that's doing. This wasn't high school. For some reason, I thought yeah. it was middle. So, so there's been two things that have happened in Providence. One is the teacher and student designed high schools that just opened this year. Yeah. And then the other, there was um, some work that was done a few years ago up, which was uh, an attempt to try to reimagine the way uh, partnerships and contracts worked in local schools. Okay. And my understanding is it it worked for a bit. And then there were some concerns about the district uh, uh, supporting some of the professional development work that was part of the agreement, and then it, it kind of phased out when the superintendent changed and, and so on. What I would suggest is that we can learn from those lessons, and I would also suggest that it wasn't as comprehensive as what I'm proposing. Okay. Thank you. Senator Metz, the real Senator Metz. Yes, thank you. Commissioner, um I was interested when you were talking about that uh, you, you would uh, hope that the low-performing schools, uh, I just, uh, here's, what, here's what happened years ago. There were some low-income parents over my way that organized, and they made a school, the model school, and put a lot of resources there. So the next thing you know, the kids from my neighborhood got bussed out and kids from across town got bussed in. Mm -hmm. So I'm very concerned, mm -hmm. whatever school, however it shapes out, mm -hmm. that there's equal access and yep. equal options so that, so that doesn't happen. Yep. And in, I, I, saw it, I saw it happen. There's a history of that. Yep. And in our language is the idea that schools serve their residents first. If, after accounting for their residents, then they have extra seats, then they could choose to make those extra seats open for other schools or other districts. But absolutely, I'm, I'm, I really am a believer in the neighborhood school. I really am a believer. I'm just trying to give some tools to the neighborhood schools so they'd have to serve their residents first. This is not a proposal for reshuffling and everybody goes to a different school. It's, it's not like that at all. Other questions? Okay, Senator Satchel. I, I don't have a question. I'd just comment. like to finish with a comment, if I may. Uh, Dr. Wagner, I just want to thank you for being here tonight um, and just want to thank you for the work that you're doing right now. And I, we had met previously, and, and we don't agree on everything. But um, one thing that I, I will say, and, and I'll say it on behalf of the people that I teach with and the people that I've talked to, um, first of all, your approach to doing things in comparison to your predecessor is a lot different on so many levels and I want to thank you for that first of all. Um, I, I think that what you're doing in terms of communicating with educators and, and really trying to, to build a coalition, I think that you know it, it, it's going to go a long way and I want to just say as you know as an elected official, as a leader, but also as a teacher, mm -hmm. I personally appreciate it. So I just wanted thank to thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. A lot. Thank you. Thank you. We all thank you for coming yep. this evening thank you for and me. having the open lines of communication and having dialogue. Um, want to thank you very much. Great, great. Do have a and we should talk about that school. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the the deck. <laughs>